All right, in this video, I want to look at the notion of linear independence and linear dependence. So um, vectors can, a collection of vectors is either linear independent or linearly dependent. And what we say, so we say the vectors v sub 1, v sub 2, v sub n are linearly independent. If we look at the linear combination a sub 1, v sub 1, plus a sub 2, v sub 2, plus dot, 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 up to a sub n, v sub n, if, uh, when we set that equal to the zero vector, if the only solution to this equation um, is when the a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub n are all zero, we say those vectors are linearly independent. Um, if this equation is true when at least one of the a sub i's is not zero, well then we, we say at that point that the collection is linearly dependent. Um, and kind of intuitively, I guess the notion, if you have a, a, a collection of vectors that's linearly dependent, in a sense you kind of have some uh, redundant vectors in the sense that you can get rid of some vectors if it's linearly dependent, you know, chop it down so that you only have, you know, fewer than what you started with. And the idea is you can still write any vector in that space as a collection of that smaller set of vectors. Um, that's the notion of linear dependence. You kind of have, uh, you basically have vectors that are linear combinations of the others, and therefore in the sense they're, um, they're not needed. So we're trying to chop down our set, make it as small as possible, um, so that we just sort of have the fewest number of vectors so that we can write any vector in that space as a combination of those remaining ones. I guess is kind of, that to me is the intuitive idea. Um, if you have a, a linearly dependent set, somehow you got too many. If you have a linearly independent set, well, hopefully um, you can use those to um, not necessarily write the other vectors, all the other vectors, but ultimately that's what we're trying to do. We're going to try to find a small enough set so that we can write the other vectors in terms of those remaining vectors. And this is what ties into the notion of... Um, the basis for um, a vector space. But again, we're not there yet. So again, just at this point, think intuitively. Uh, somehow, if you have linearly dependent vectors, those are just linear combinations of other ones. So in a sense, you can get rid of them, and you're not losing any information. That's how I think about it. OK, so just two questions here. We've got two sets of vectors, uh, two different examples. We'll do these in two different videos. And we're just going to decide if these uh, these collection of vectors are linearly independent or dependent. So we'll do part A here first. So again, what we're doing is we're just looking for solutions to the system of equations, uh, or the, uh, the equation a sub 1 times 1, negative 2, 0, plus a sub 2 times 4, 0, 8, a sub 3 times 3, negative 1, 5. And again, we're going to set that equal to the 0 vector. So what I'm going to do is just write this uh, in a, as a matrix and then do some row reduction. So we have 1, negative 2, 0, 4, 0, 8, 3, negative 1, 5, and then 0, 0, 0. So now, again, we're just going to try to put this in a our reduced echelon form. So I'm going to do 2 times row 1, add that to row 2 to get my new row 2. And ultimately all we're doing is we're just trying to decide if we have trivial or non-trivial solutions. So that's where we're headed. Um, so if we do that, let's see, the bottom row we're going to leave alone. The first row we're going to leave alone. The second row, so 2 times 1 plus negative 2 is 0. 2 times 4 plus 0 is going to give us 8. 2 times 3 minus 1 is going to give us 5. Oh, hey, we've got uh, rows that are exactly the same. I'm going to take negative 1 of, uh, multiply the second row by negative 1, add that to row 3 to get my new row 3. Um, if we do that, that's just going to make the bottom row all into zeros. Now, you may think, hey, automatically you have non-trivial solutions, but we still need to do be a little careful. Um, and you'll see this especially in this second example. So I'm going to keep grinding away here. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is just divide the second row by 8. So if I do that, again, we're leaving the third row alone. We have 0, 1. Um, I guess we'll have 5 eighths and then 0. Again, leaving the first row alone. 
And the last thing I want to do is get a zero in the first row, second column. So to do that, I'm going to multiply the second row by negative 4 and add that to the first row to get my new first row. So we have 0, 0, 0 on the bottom, 0, 1, 5 eighths. So let's see, you can check my arithmetic here. So negative 4 times 0 plus 1 is 1. Uh, negative 4 times 1 is negative 4 plus 4 is 0. OK, there's the easy part. So I guess negative 4 times 5 eighths, that's going to be negative 5 halves. Negative 5 halves plus 3 would leave us with positive 1 half. And now, to me, that looks like a pretty good form. So notice, again, you can think about this, um, you can think about this correspondingly as being the system of equations. 1 a sub 1 plus 1 half of a sub 3 equals 0. We have 0 a 1. We've got uh, 1 a sub 2 plus 5 eighths a sub 3 equals 0. And then our, our last variable, uh, our last scalar, a sub 3, we can, that's going to be our free variable. And we can just set that equal to some number k. So if we set that equal to k, if we backtrack now, well, if we plug in k, we would get uh, a sub 1 plus 1 half k equals 0. Or we would get a sub 1 equals, well, negative 1 half times k. Um, and likewise for a sub 2, if we plug in k, we would have a sub 2 plus 5 eighths times k equals 0. So we would just get negative 5 eighths times k. So it says basically we have non-trivial solutions of the form negative 1 half times k, negative 5 eighths times k, and then uh, pick your favorite value for k. And we'll get lots of different uh, solutions to this, uh, this original, that original equation that we started with. Okay, so we can figure out different values for a1, a2, a3 by simply picking different values for k. So this tells us we have non-trivial solutions, which basically means um, the a sub 1, a sub 2, and a sub 3 value don't have to all equal 0. And that tells us that our set is actually linearly dependent. So we could have uh, taken one of those vectors out, is, is in, in this case, is what's happening. So that's all there is to it. You're just doing a little row reduction. So I'm going to do the other example as well. Um, you'll see the same thing happens. We'll get a row of zeros, but it still turns out that in this case, well, we actually end up with a linearly independent set in part B. Um, so, but if you want to, definitely take a look at that one. We'll step through it. And then we'll tie this notion together, um, you know, linearly independence and this notion of a span to create what's called a basis for a vector space.